So this is what the Lord gave me. Pray every day. Let me see what you see and say what you say. So for those of you here, the radical remnant that came out tonight, let's say it out loud together. Ready? Pray every day. Let me see what you see and say what you say. That's a good prayer. You could say that every day. Every day. Lord, today, let me see what you see and let me say what you say. And we'll tie scripture into that. But it's in every minute of every day that we could be thinking like this. Even when I meet a stranger, I could be saying to the Lord, let me see in this person that you're introducing me to for the first time, let me see what you see in them. Let me say what you want me to say to them, not what I'm reacting to in, in the natural here. And so much of our communication with people is nonverbal. So you have to really be aware of this. You have to be in the moment when you're with them. And it could be this weekend. You could be at a family party for Thanksgiving, and you could be meeting people for the first time. And I know the longer I've been serving the Lord, the more I realize how much he loves people. More than anything else, he loves people. He doesn't want one person to perish, like we said, that book that Ed Silvoso wrote. On, uh, I talked about it on Sunday, that none should perish. And if he elevates people above everything else in creation, why don't we? <laughs> we should. We should take on that character. Even the ones that are a little crunchy, even the ones that are a little difficult to, to get close to or that have a lot of pain in their life and they're reacting to things, that might be the special assignment that the Lord has given you this weekend, to just to hug a porcupine. Because weren't you a porcupine at one time? And somebody hugged you, right? So why not? Why not pay it forward? Pull a, little, pull a few quills out when you get home from the party. So let's think about some of the verses where Jesus actually said this about himself. And if he's our model, which he is, he's the perfect man. He's the ultimate pinnacle of who we aim to be. The one that we're trying to be transformed into is Jesus. And he said to his disciples, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. So can we make that confession? I can do nothing of myself but only what I see the father do or what Jesus does or what the Holy Spirit is prompting me to do. So we have this wonderful advantage that we live in this dispensation when the Holy Spirit has been poured out into the earth. So if they were doing it with power and effectiveness in the Old Testament, we have a much greater gift than they had, that we are now the dwelling place of Holy Spirit. So it's never that he's far away. It would only be that we're not tapping into what he's already placed inside of us. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. And if you'll look back over your life and think about some of the mistakes you made, often, at least in my life, I hadn't put enough prayer into those decisions. And you know what they say, if it looks too good to be true, finish it for me. It probably is too good to be true. Who said it, Zandy? I knew somebody would know that one. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Well, you know, don't be too skeptical, but... Pray into it. Don't get taken. Don't get duped. For whatever he does, whatever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. I don't speak on my own authority, he said in John 12, 49. I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. I don't want to settle for anything less than this in my life or your life or the people that I love. This is the kind of relationship that we can have with the Lord. Hmm. Lord, I want to pray every day. Let me see what you see and say what you say. And nothing from my corrupt nature, my carnal nature, that still tries to resurrect itself. And I love this one. I've been standing on this verse for 40 years since I first got saved and somebody told it to me because in, in my business, financial advisory business, People would put these plans together, and this would be a good verse to quote them, unless the Lord builds a house, right? Unless the Lord builds a house, then those that labor to raise that house, they will have worked hard for nothing. 
Unless the eternal stands watch over the city, those who guard it have wasted their time. So the Lord's got to be in our plans. We can make the plans, it says in Proverbs, but he directs our steps. Right? So, Lord, unless you're building this house, we're just going to be laboring in vain. So we want your approval on the things that we're doing. We don't want to go do something in our own nature and then ask you to bless it after the fact. We want to fast and pray. This kind of unbelief in my heart only comes out through fasting and prayer. This kind of devil in this other person only comes out by fasting and prayer and digging in and, and understanding the warfare that's involved. For God provides for his own. It's pointless to get up early and work hard and go to bed late, anxiously laboring for food to eat. Anybody been there? Thank you for being honest. It feels noble to work hard, but if the Lord's not building the house, you're laboring in vain. So we want to be aligned with his plan for our lives. And if we're not praying and asking him every day, it's easy to get off course and do a good idea that's not a God idea. Huh, it's pointless, Rich, to get up early and work hard and go to bed late, anxiously laboring for food to eat. <laughs> for God provides for you, son. And you closed your biggest deal this year, didn't you? Yeah, see, it's amazing. Get better with age, like good wine. For God provides for those he loves, even while they're sleeping. I really like that one. Anybody else into power naps? <laughs> 10 minutes, 15 minutes? It's amazing, right? They're finding out so much more about the importance of sleep, and God knew it all along, right? He told us to get the rest that we need. But if you think about it this way, your brain is not a computer, but in some regards it acts like one because it's gathering a lot of data. And when you sleep at night, the, the brain is loading the data into the cloud. <laughs> and if you get interrupted, it's not loading properly. If you're not sleeping well because you're anxious and you're worried about things, it's not uploading well. And when you take a power nap in the middle of a day, you know, if you're young, you don't have to do this, but as you get a little older, 10 minutes could make a lot of difference. But it's like rebooting a computer. This is just language that, that the doctors are using and saying it's really good for you to just shut down in the middle of the day and then restart again, and, and it's like a fresh start for your afternoon. And maybe they don't want you to do that on the job. Go to your car. Take a nap in your car during your lunch break. I don't know. Do whatever you got to do. But all I'm saying is if we're anxious and worried about things, there's a negative feedback loop in our lives that that creates because the less we sleep, the more we worry and the more anxious that we get. So even if it means coming in for prayer ministry and coming in for counseling and helping get another perspective on your situation, don't hold on to it. Talk about it with people that you love and you trust and you respect. All right, in verse uh, 3 of John chapter 3, I know everybody knows this. I'm giving it to you in the voice version. It says, Jesus was speaking, I tell you the truth, David Torres, only someone who experiences birth for a second time can hope to see the kingdom of God. So in verse 5, he says very similar language. If someone does not experience water and spirit birth, there's no chance he will make it into God's kingdom. And I'm saying that now because I always took that to mean only when we die we can get to heaven, but we have to be born again in order to get into heaven when we die. But I came to realize that this is God's kingdom here in the earth. And that unless I'm born again, I can't see that it's there. So clearly if I can't even see it, I can't enter it. But I can enter into the king's domain at any point in my life. If I'm alive, I could be in the middle of the most secular setting and I could still be walking under the dominion of King Jesus because the kingdom is where the king has domain. That's in our heart. So we don't have to be influenced negatively by other people. And why am I saying this? Because I can just tell you over the years, many people would use Thanksgiving as one of those eye rolling moments where, oh boy, there's going to be some drama. Right, And you watch some of the comedy movies when families get together and people say things you know, about that. And it can be funny, but I think we could take it as an opportunity because it's not just Thanksgiving. It's all through the holiday season. It could be if you do work for a big corporation, there's Christmas parties. And there's all kinds of things happening that people have their guard down and they're more open and they're hearing things in the, in the, in the malls when they're shopping. They're hearing Christmas music and 
I personally was very touched and moved during the Christmas season in the year that I got saved. I, I accepted the Lord on January 1st, but it was that Christmas season that was really getting me closer and closer and, and making me want to walk away from the things of the world that I was so attached to. Something about Christmas in my life, at least, really made a difference. I, I was much more open to what was being said to me. So that could be other people. And it doesn't have to just be this time of year. I'm just saying we should always be thinking about it, but especially now because the windows of opportunity open more quickly. So then in John 6, he said, I've come down from heaven not to pursue my own agenda, but to do what my father desires for me to do. And that's no different for Will right there in the back row or Jim or any one of us that's here. We could be saying the same thing. It's not, right? Jesus said, if you want to find your life, lose the plan that you thought you had and take on my plan for your life and then watch what happens. Watch what I can do with your life. That's what Jesus said. I'm here on behalf of the Father who sent me. Don't you believe me when I say I abide in the Father and the Father dwells in me? Yes, and he dwells in us too. So at that Thanksgiving party tomorrow, if you've got a cranky old uncle or aunt or somebody has a disagreement with you politically, instead of banging heads with people. Say, Lord, show me what you see when you look at my cranky uncle. <laughs> Let me say to him what you want me to say. Not, not that Italian, wise guy, sarcastic answer that I want to give to show everybody how funny I am. It's very biting. You know, sarcasm, boy, that's, there's some bitterness in there somewhere. and That's not the love of Jesus. So let's, let's shine that light, amen? I'm not making this up, he says, as I go along. The Father has given me these truths that I've been speaking to you, and he empowers all my actions. So can we just say a prayer right now? Can you stand up? Let's just say a prayer for having eyes to see and ears to hear the opportunities that, that the Lord opens up for us tomorrow, even for, for the Thanksgiving meal. Let me just ask you right now to make us aware of what you want us to do and say when we're with family members or wherever we're going to be on, on Thanksgiving for this holiday, if we're traveling, if we're in a different part of the country, those that are watching, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, but also the heart of compassion to look past the outward things that we're seeing and hearing and to look past and see through and beyond into their heart, into their, into their pain, and then to translate what you say to us from heaven into earthly language to be able to penetrate through that pain and bring, bring healing and even have opportunities to pray and even have opportunities to lead some of our relatives and, and neighbors and family members who we're going to be with to the Lord. Lead them to you. Lead them to the best news that they'll ever hear in their whole life because we're recognizing you've put us here for this reason, just like you did Jesus. We are your hands and your feet, and we want to be that tomorrow when we're with our families. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I'll keep you awake, keep you going up and down. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because there's some Old Testament verses in here that um, I wanted to get to. It says, a tale of three kings. And you might have heard this analogy before because we have King Saul was a king that the people asked for. Who was his successor? Thank you. Just keeping you awake. King David came in after King Saul. And uh, boy, talk about a difference in two different kings, right? So as we compare King Saul and his successor, King David, we see two kings with very different outcomes. Saul's leadership ended in ruin. What a shame. He had lots of potential. God named Saul to be the king. Even though it wasn't God's idea for them to have the king, he still was God's anointed. So there was talent and there was a lot of potential in Saul, but his life ended in ruin. David, in spite of his many flaws, remained a man after God's own heart. So much so that the third king we're going to talk about, the king of all kings, Jesus, was birthed in David's bloodline. That's quite a position of honor that David has, don't you think? This somewhat, I don't know, I would say he was rejected by his family because when Samuel came to anoint one of Jesse's sons, Jesse, his father, didn't even invite David to come. 
as if it was no chance it could be him. And, and what did God say to Samuel? You look at the out, outward appearance. Mankind looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. So here was this young man out on the back side of the mountain watching sheep, but he was writing, Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds the hands have made. He didn't write that, but Psalm 8 is where that song came from, and he did write that. What is man that you are mindful of him? So God saw this heart of this young man. It wasn't because he went to some school of government to be a president. It was because God saw his heart. So much so that when they were questioning whether Jesus could be the Messiah, they said he would have to come from Bethlehem because he would have to be of the house of David. Everybody knew that. And we have the genealogies in, in the New Testament to show us that he is on both sides of his family. And they were both chosen to be king. They both sought counsel from Samuel. They had a, a mighty man of God that they were getting their advice from. When they faced Israel's enemy, right, the Philistines, Saul would not go fight Goliath, would he? None of the men would fight Goliath. But David killed Goliath. Saul made excuses when he made mistakes and it's lots of chapters and verse about the life of Saul. He blamed other people. And he showed a lack of trust. He was, he was impatient. When things didn't go the way he wanted them to go, he took matters into his own hands. Think that's a lesson for us? <laughs> yeah. Only do what you see the Father doing. Only say what you hear the Father saying. That might mean you have to wait. You might be like Elijah who's waiting for the raven to bring the food to the brook. But you know God is going to provide for you. Don't step outside of the blessings of obedience to the Lord. But we need to hear his voice. When David did make a mistake and recognized his disobedience that led to sin, he repented of his wrong. And that's what I would say would make him a man after God's own heart. He recognized his sin. He repented of his sin. And, and God forgave him. And God was merciful to him. So if we had to sum up the difference in the outcomes between Saul and David, I would say in one word, it would be why we gather on Wednesday nights, which is to pray. Prayer was the difference. And I just want to spend some time on this because there's time and time again in David's life where he could have taken matters into his own hands. But for some reason, his heart was so turned to God that over and over again, he, he learned that I can wait before I make this decision and I can inquire of the Lord. How many want that? Please raise your hand. We have, to, we have to hear the voice of the Lord. We can't just go on our human logic. We've got to ascend beyond our human logic and make sure whatever decisions we're making line up with the word. And there's also wisdom in a multitude of counsel. There's lots of good friends and, and good, solid Christians that know the word that, that will come in agreement with you for the decisions that you're making. So Saul rose to power because the people demanded a king so that they could be like the other nations. Bad idea. We don't want to be like the other nations. We are a chosen generation. We sang it, right? A royal priesthood, a peculiar people. We've been set apart from God. We are the sent ones. That apostolic calling on our lives is to not live like the world lives, to live at a higher level of our humanity. But they wanted a king. That was not God's perfect plan. But they didn't pray about it, did they? They just said, we want to be like the other nations. We don't want to have, an, we don't want to have a prophet as our leader. We want to be like them. Boy, that's a warning for us. That's all I could say. That's a warning for us. We shouldn't be chasing after the things of the world that's appealing to the world. And it says about the Pharisees, the leaders in the quote-unquote church of the first century, Palestine, it says they were lovers of money. So there you go. There's one way that the church could be chasing after the world's goods. If we believe that God is our provider, then we trust him for our provision. Don't have to be chasing after it. He'll give it to us when he knows he can trust us with it. David's life and his leadership showed that he often, I can't say he did it every time, because when he was out on that roof and he looked at Bathsheba, he wasn't praying to the Lord that night. He was having a bad night, and that took the whole country down. Right? It doesn't take much. But often, and I'm going to show you some of the scriptures that, that could be a real good role model for us, he sought the Lord before he made his decisions. 
Saul was impatient and failed to seek God's counsel, even to the point where he went and sought the counsel of a witch. Remember the witch of Endor? And if you're old enough to remember the show Bewitched, Endora was, her wife, was the mother, right? That's where it came from, the witch of Endor. David is out there on the backside of this mountain. I could picture it in the middle of the night watching these sheep, and he's got his harp, and he's playing, and he's saying, Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens, and if we think we have a good sky around here, can you imagine what it was 2,000, 3,000 years ago? Man, no, no natural light, no cities shining a lot of light. He could, he could see the sky so clear, and it's just really, it's breathtaking, isn't it? You're out there, and, and he says, you've set your glory in the heavens. When I consider all I'm looking at, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him. Maybe that stops us from praying a little bit sometimes, that we think he's too far away or he's too busy. Or if we call him father and our father was distant, we think God is distant. Can we just cancel those thoughts right now? He's never too busy. He always wants to hear from us. If you're a natural parent, you know how much you love it when your children call you. And, and share their lives with you and seek your advice. That's how God is towards us. If we feel it, imagine how he feels. And imagine how much he wants to talk to us. And he's saying, I'm so glad you called when you pray. <laughs> For you've made man a little lower than the angels. I'm not sure that's the best interpretation. It says Elohim, right? Which is a smaller version of God. <laughs> We'll leave that one alone for now. And you've crowned him with glory and honor. Here's one that I've thought of often. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. David was displaying a lot of really good leadership, even to the point where he had the enemy's king fooled that he was fighting on behalf of the enemy, the Philistines, but he wasn't. But during one of the raids, while he was out fighting, another enemy came and, and ransacked his camp and kidnapped his wife and children and all the men's wives and children. And they stole everything from them. And the men wanted to kill David. You remember this? Not, not the greatest day to be the leader. And that's why it says in verse 6, he was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. What did David do? Come on, say it, but, you seeing it up there? Say it, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. When do we have to do this? All the time, all the time, just living our lives, we have to do this, all the time. It's not as bad maybe of a, of a situation as he was in, but we've got to constantly go back to the source of our strength. All my fountains, it says in the Psalms, all my fountains are in you. I want you to be the one feeding the springs of my life, not the world. That's empty. That's not going to sustain me. But, Lord, I'm going to strengthen myself in you. And David turned it around, and he went and got everything that the enemy had and more because he didn't cave when the pressure was on. Later, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, I love this word, he inquired of the Lord. That's such a good word for prayer. I'm going to go inquire of the Lord. Anybody ever feel this way? You sit down for your, for your whatever you call it, your devotional time, your private study time. Maybe you're working to, uh, a plan to read through the Bible in a certain amount of time. I mean, you could definitely get through the Bible in a year, that, especially if you have audio Bible. That's not a hard thing to do at all. But maybe you have a different idea. Maybe you're studying a certain topic. Maybe you're doing a word study on glory or a million different word studies you could do. And you start out with a bit of a plan, but then all of a sudden, as you start digging, you find more and more treasure the more you dig. Am I the only one? And with the computer software that's available today for free, it's unbelievable how many tools are out there. Bible Gateway and Bible Hub are two that I would highly recommend. And I'd also be happy to show you how to use them. If you ever just, I'll pop open the laptop and show you how I use them at least. Free, amazing. And the Lord said to David, 
Wait, I'll start at the beginning. Shall I go up against the Philistines? He inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. Now that might not sound like too big of a deal, but I'll just tell you that when we first started the church here, there were many people coming to visit that hadn't been in a charismatic or Pentecostal-style church. And, and they liked it. It was different for them. It was longer. The worship went longer. The preaching went longer. They weren't used to people praying at the altar after the service. They never really were in a church service where demons were manifesting. <laughs> and we weren't freaked out by it. Trisha was like, bring it on. Bring it on. She's casting out demons at the altar. And they're like, hmm, that's different. But then they realize, wow, I guess if, if somebody did have demons, this would be the best place for them to be so they can get rid of them. Right? We're evicting them. And uh, they would, one of the guys, I never forgot this, he, he was sitting on the board of a big ministry, and he said there was a poll done by Barna, I think, at the time, or it might have just been the seminary that he was on the board of. And they did a, a poll of all the people that went to church, and 95% of the people said that when they went to church on Sunday, they did not expect to hear from God. Wow. Yeah, really? Wow. What is it? It's just, it's the Moose Lodge. We're just getting together, you know, as a social club. It's not the Moose Lodge, right? We sang it. Your name is power. You break every stronghold. We didn't get saved by a weak God. We got pulled out of a pit, and it needed to be a strong God to get us out of the pit some of us were in. So shall I go up? He's just asking an open question, and the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. They, these people, these 95% of the people, they're going to church. They don't expect to hear from God in a church service. Do you think they expect to hear from God in their own prayer time? No. Well, then how could you live a life of prayer if, if it's not being demonstrated for you somewhere? And this would be a good place for it to be demonstrated, I would hope. So that's a big problem. Because if you think, why should I bother praying? Again, I'm just kind of sharing you the the summary of some of the things that we heard. Well, listen, God's in charge of everything. He knows the end from the beginning. So we can't move the hand of God. We can't change his mind. He's in control. So if something happens, it's because he allowed it to happen. Did you ever hear that one? So why would I pray? <laughs> Such a defeatist mindset. Well, no. Okay, what did God allow us to do? He allowed us to make decisions. He allowed us to have a free will. And in the garden, there was no sin until they sinned. And then that opened up warfare. So you could say, well, I haven't had every prayer answered. But have you had some answered? Do you think your prayers have made a difference in your life? You better believe they have. Because some of it is in play. And it's not because God allows somebody to die because he wanted another angel in heaven. He doesn't. He, he's the one who gives life, not takes life away. So let's just be careful that we don't get this messed up. For David, it was a very common thing to inquire of the Lord and to hear an answer. And I hope we can all say that that becomes a normal part of our life. And we hear clearly. So when Tricia and I were, were being told that, you know, the people that were uh, over us at the time said, we, we want you to go to Burnsville and start a church. And, and we weren't going to just go and do it and try it. We wanted to hear from the Lord. And we both heard separately that it was good, that we should do that. And I'll tell you, if you're married and you're not getting agreement on a big decision, wait. I'm not saying you don't have to sometimes make decisions where you're not both in full agreement, but wait. And, and the Lord will continue to, continue to show you things. So David went to Balperazim. That's such a great name if you've studied this word. And David defeated them there, and he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water, like a dam breaking. Therefore, he called the name of that place Balperazim, the place of the breakthrough. And they left their images there, and David and his men carried them away. And the Philistines went up once again, and they deployed themselves in the valley. And therefore, David inquired of the Lord. This is a common thing for him to do. He's a, he's a leader, he's a king, he's a warrior, but he recognized, I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to inquire of the Lord. 
And therefore David inquired of the Lord, and he said, You shall not go up. Circle around behind them and come up upon them from the front of the mulberry trees. Man, see? So this is a very specific strategy that if he hadn't prayed, he might have been plundered because he went in straight up. Pause and pray. Ask the Lord, should I go? No, you're not going to go up that way this time. You're going to circle around them and come from the front of the mulberry trees. When you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly, and the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. That's a pretty specific battle strategy, if you ask me. Your, uh, your batting average goes way up when you pray, and you hear from the Lord. Well, what if I do if, I, if I'm not hearing from the Lord? What's the answer, Dave? Keep on praying. You wait. Keep on praying. Tell him you got to sleep on it. And David did so, and he, and he drove back the Philistines. David inquired of the Lord and said, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save this city called Keilah. This is a hard story, I'll have to tell you. I'm not going to be going much longer here. And I'm not going to keep you real long tonight. Um, we can pray. I'm always, that's always something we could do. My, my main goal was to just try to Set your heart for the weekend and for thinking about who you might be with, and not just those of you that are here, but anybody who's watching online, because it's just one of those ripe opportunities I have found over the years. Really, the next month, right, all the way up through Christmas and, and New Year's, it's a ripe season. But instead of reacting with the first thing that comes to our mind or, or allowing ourselves to get emotionally hijacked, right, because you know your family members can push buttons that other people can't push. <laughs> and give you indigestion uh, over the turkey if you get into an argument at the table. But, but I'm not meaning to make it so negative. I'm saying he'll give you awesome opportunities if you're looking for them. So this is, this is a tough one because David is called to be the king, and Keilah is a, a Hebrew city, so it's one of the cities under David's rulership if he were the king, but Saul is the king, and David's on the run. So David could have easily said, well, why would I bother going and fighting the Philistines on behalf of this city? Because Saul's trying to kill me. So let him try to go defend them. But he was still enough of a man of God to say, Lord, do you want me to do this? Because if you want me to do it and I don't do it, then I'm going to miss your day of visitation. You were willing to use me to win a battle. So I have to ask and then I have to listen. And, he, and the Lord said, yes, David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, what? We're afraid right here in Judah, and you want us to go? How much more if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Are you sure you're tuned into the right channel, David? Well, when you're a leader, you better know which channel you're tuned into. And David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, Yes, arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. Now, if you jump ahead a little to verse 9, <laughs> there were spies, and the spies went and told Saul that David was here fighting on behalf of Israel, and he sent an army to take David out at Keilah. So all the men were probably looking at David and said, See, I told you so. This isn't working out so good. But what did David do? Once David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to the high priest, Abiathar, bring the ephod here. Okay? You know what that is? That's the priest's garment, the ephod. It represents a symbol of hearing from the Lord. Right? It's, it's reminding myself that there's a sacred connection between the Jewish people and the Christian people and God. And when, when, they, when you see that in the Old Testament, bring the ephod here, David was again inquiring of the Lord. It was a way to represent that I'm going to pray now and I need to hear from him because this is an urgent situation we're in. So David said, O oh Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand, into Saul's hand? Now what would you want to think the answer would be. No, you just saved them from the Philistines. <laughs> of course they won't deliver you into their hand. But he needs to know because 
If they will deliver him, they got to get out of here. And the Lord says, well, he says it again. Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell me, your servant. The Lord said, yes, he will come down. And then David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? David's nodding his head. I guess he's read this one already. And the Lord said, they will deliver you. So he had to take off. So look, here's the reason I'm bringing this out is not to get you depressed, is that people will let you down, okay? Don't jump to conclusions that if you do somebody a favor, they're automatically going to do a favor back to you. The Bible says to guard our heart, for out of our heart flow the issues of life, yes? So we could set ourselves up for disappointment if we're putting people on a pedestal and expecting them to be like God. They're not going to be. So you really need to be continually bringing all your questions about life to the Lord and only hearing his voice. It doesn't mean that you can't get good advice from people. You can. But these people bowed to the intimidation of the king. They knew that he would wipe them out if they didn't give David up. He would have wiped out the whole city if he knew, if Saul knew that David really was there. So, look, that's, I'm not going to, take an offense over that because these people took a cowardly way out. I'm not going to take an offense over that. I'm going to walk away because God told me what to do. And I can always stay one step ahead of the devil. Amen? Can we stand?